Good afternoon. Welcome to our fourth Sunday of Advent. Our scripture this week is taken from John chapter 6, reading verses 1 through 15. It says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw signs that he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what was, he was going to do. Philip answered him, It wouldn't take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them to fulfill 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over and those who had e eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. May God bless our reading of his holy word. Friends, today I wanted to talk a little bit about Jerusalem as we're journeying through the Easter season. What makes Ju Jerusalem so important for Christians? Well, at least in my opinion, it is that the ultimate sacrifice ever presented to any deity happened outside the walls of Calvary. That is where our blessed Lord, the only Son of God, became the sacrificial lamb to atone for our sins, not just for those who died before him, not just for those who witnessed his crucifixion. His sacrifice was for the sins that have yet to come. As God, Jesus of Nazareth, knew what was to come, he prophesied what would happen to Jerusalem once Rome decided to conquer it. He also must have known how sinful the generations, centuries upon centuries later, would become. Irregardless, our blessed Lord went through agonies that no one in our time could ever understand. Now, considering today's gospel reading, anyone who knows the story of Christ knows the feeding of the 5,000. The people followed him, and Christ knew that, the th that there had been to have been hungry people there. After all, they were there for a long time. In fact, he was definitely right. The people were hungry, and Christ told his disciples to figure out how to feed them all. They come back to Christ saying that they only had some loaves of bread and some fish. Basically, they only had enough to feed maybe a handful of people, not thousands. It was then that our blessed Lord took the fish and the bread, multiplied it, and fed everyone that was there. There was so much food left over that whole baskets were filled afterwards. The people were satisfied with the food, and Christ went on his way. Now take special notice at the end of the gospel in verses 14 and 15. It says, Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, This is of a truth, the prophet that is to come into the world. Jesus therefore knew that they would come and take him by force and make him king. And he fled again into the mountains himself alone. Taken by force. That's kind of peculiar, isn't it? So let's read part of the passage again. When he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, he fled into the mountains himself alone. This is a curious passage to me. We as Christians address Jesus of Nazareth by many titles. We call him Lord, King, Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, God, the Son of God, God, and so on. And yet, 
we've been there at times of this event, had we been there at the time of this event, Jesus would have run away, literally, than to be crowned king. There are several reasons why, for the sake of time, I'm going to just talk about three of them today. The first reason, reason that he refused the title of king is because of the politics at the time. At the time of the Romans, only the Roman Empire, with the backing of the Roman Senate, could declare someone a king. Herod, for example, was the appointed king at the time. So if Jesus declared himself as a king, that would be treason against Caesar, which is the capital, a capital offense. Incidentally, this was the charge that Christ would be convicted of. This was why the Romans humiliated him by nailing him to the infamous sign, I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, above his head on the cross. His crown was a crown of thorns, adding to his torture. Now, the second reason is that he did not want his followers to fall into the same trap the Israelites of David's time had. Remember in the Old Testament where the Israelites wanted a king? It says in Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, verse 18, And you shall cry out in that day from the face of the king, whom you have chosen to yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day, because you desired unto yourselves a king. We all know how well that went. As Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ is God, the Son incarnate, who is the Father, as found in Genesis. Imagine telling God that the creation will grant the title of king to the creator. That would reduce the value of the kinship title that God already has being God. Now, the third reason is that the kinship that Christ is not a type of king that people want it. Consider what a king was during the time of Christ. In an absolute monarchy, the king's word is law and final. The king's power is to judge, condemn, and absolve in ab absolute. The king is also meant to raise a standing army to not only defend the kingdom, but also to conquer more land for the sake of the kingdom. The Jews at this time deemed the Messiah would come as a king on a chariot to liberate the Israelites from all of their enemies, including Rome. Obviously, Jesus Christ was not there to liberate the Israelites from the Romans. He was not there to bring the Jews to become a power host in geo geopolitics. No, Jesus came down to liberate all of humanity from sin. Mary, Jesus' mother, watched her son carry the cross to Calvary, where he died. No one knew for sure if Jesus would rise from the dead. All they knew was that Jesus became a physically broken man and answered for his ministry with his life. So what is the comparison with the feeding of the 5,000? Jesus' total ministry, according to the Gospels, was about three years. That is a very short time to do what is needed to do on earth. In a broad picture, Jesus really did not do much compared to the history of the world. His teachings were said to a handful of people, similar to the 5,000 of barley bread and the two fish that they initially had. It stands to reason that if there was no help from God, Christianity would quite possibly not exist today. And yet, Christianity does exist. There are most likely more copies of the gospel than there are people on earth. There are texts not only in books, but also on the internet. Ministers multiply the gospel to the point where the gospel message overflows above and beyond the satisfaction of one's hunger. Christianity gives humanity the message that forever multiplies across time. Long after we have fallen asleep in the Lord, the message of Christianity shall always be multiplied. That is the power of the true King of Kings. The kinship of Christ is not bound by blood or crown or any materialistic means. Christ the King is an eternal constant that no human being could compare. Christ could only claim that title once he met his earthly fate. He had to wait for the crown of thorns to be placed on his head. Christ needed to mix the mix of blood, sweat, and tears to anoint him. He needed to proceed to the throne on the cross. He had to go through his path, 
through his passion to become our king. Christ could not become king until he died on the cross. I would like to conclude with this thought. At the end of the passage, Jesus is said to have fled alone to the mountains. He did not flee out of fear or disdain or anything of that sort. He was not fleeing from something, but rather to something. He was fleeing to where he needed to go to become our king, not their king, not the king of the Israelites or the Romans or any other civilization. Christ became the king to all of us, to all of God's children. No matter where we are in this world, we are all brothers and sisters under our blessed Lord, our King, Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so thankful for your reminder of just the marvelous work that Jesus did when he walked this world, which was then multiplied again when he rose for the dead and the forgiveness of our sins was there and for all people. Lord God, we are thankful that you give us and point us in directions to where we can share the gospel, where we can build more people for the kingdom of God. Lord, there's times I know that we hesitate from that. We step back. We don't feel that we are adequate. But Lord, in those times, help us to lean on you. Help us to remember that we don't walk anywhere on this earth alone, that you are by our side every step of the way. So as we continue through this Lenten season, let us be by your side as you journey toward that cross for the most wonderful gift that you have ever given us that will happen on Calvary. Amen. I thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I miss you all and I will see you soon. God bless. Amen.